Welcome back, Mobile Home Park Nation. For Neiman here again today with another episode of the Mobile Home Park Lawyer Podcast. Today's special guest, this guy is a longtime friend of mine, financial wizard. He's uh, my chief investment officer. Pretty sure this is his first and probably his last podcast experience, uh, guest experience. Um, I'm sure he's going to love it, but uh, please help me welcome Logan Moore. Logan, what's going on, man? Hey, how's it going? Thanks. Uh, thanks for bringing me on. And uh... Yeah, we'll see how this goes. I may or may not make another appearance. You 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 set several distinct firsts for my guests. Uh, your first guest to be the godparent to one of my children. You're the first guest to be ten feet away from me where I while I record this <laughs> in the <laughs> next room. Uh, there's probably many other firsts, but uh, anyway, obviously uh, we know each other a long time. Um, but tell the rest of our audience a little bit about your background and uh, kind of how you got into MHP. Yeah, so um, yeah, like Bert said, I'm Chief Investment Officer here at Third Floor Properties. I've uh, been here about six months now, and, and it's been great, and I'll, I'll get into that in a second. But uh, in a former life, I, I worked for a local mutual fund company here in town. I uh, worked for them for about 11 years, spent about four years in accounting, and then made the jump over to the investment side of the business. Uh, while I was in the accounting department, I sat for uh, my CFA designation, charged financial analyst. Um, so that's about a two and a half, three year process. So sat through that while I was in accounting, got it, and then jumped to the investment side. Uh, came over as a municipal bond analyst, um, moved up the ranks through there uh, over seven and a half, eight years. Started as an analyst, uh, eventually got more and more responsibility and got promoted up to be assistant portfolio manager. So. At the time I left about six months ago, uh, was helping manage a billion dollar uh, high yield municipal bond portfolio, um, doing a lot of you know, not for profit real estate investments. So charter schools, senior living facilities, student housing facilities for universities. So spend a lot of time uh, on the debt side, um, analyzing and understanding different real estate investments. So um, about six years or six months ago, excuse me. Um, you know, Fred and I got to talking and I, obviously we've, we've known each other a long, long time and I've kind of watched the mobile home park business. I've watched um, him and, and third floor properties grow over the years and um, got to a point where he said, you know, I need additional help. We're going to keep growing. This thing's going to be big. And I said, all right, you know, I'm, I'm in. So uh, mobile home parks were compelling for me. Um, obviously, everybody on this podcast, probably mostly most people on this podcast know about, you know, the supply demand forces, the need for affordable housing, um, you know, all the other benefits. So that made sense to me. And I also like the idea of uh, you know, getting to go work with one of my best friends and uh, help grow a business and uh, see where this thing can go. So um, here we are six months later, just uh, churn and burn. That's right, man. No, I'm glad to have you. It's been fun. I know uh, you probably didn't know how many hours I was going to work you when you got here, but uh, you're, you're doing it. Uh, both of our wives can uh, can be mad at either one of us because uh, we never seem to run out of work. But it's been it's definitely it's definitely been fun. So Logan, like like you said, it came from a big mutual fund company. It was a billion with a B, assets under management. Um, yeah, he was the number two guy in that fund. So lots of lots of good experience. How many PPMs and offer memorandums do you think you've looked at in the last five years? Oh, in general, I would say I looked at anywhere from two to ten on a weekly basis. Um, so multiply that times 52 weeks a year times seven plus years that I was doing it and you know, lots. Quite a few, quite a few. So no, that's great. So glad to have you working on that. So obviously I know your background and how you got to MHB. Tell, tell our audience kind of what, you, what you've learned since you switched to asset classes that you didn't expect. And then tell us what, what your background, your skills really help and I know we'll get into some financial analysis stuff at a more granular level here in a couple of minutes but just for our audience that doesn't know you how you know because I'm sitting here is like I want to build my team and some of our deals you know we syndicate some we don't other deals we syndicate in particular it's a fairly complex process fairly complex capital stack and flow of funds and different hurdle rates and GPLP splits and preferred returns and you know do we pay off the preferred equity of refi retain it all that kind of stuff so obviously your financial background uh, lends you there but what other stuff could you, you want to share kind of on that topic as far as background and or 
um, you know, skills that, that skills that have helped you or things that you had to learn? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, I think certainly I'm not appreciating how simple yet how complicated this business can be. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, you hear, well, you just rent the lots and sometimes you rent the homes and um, you do that and make a lot of money and it's all good, right? But there's so many day-to-day -day things operationally that happen um, in triage that has to happen and dealing with, you know, residents and all that. The operational side of the business has been um, just a, a ton of learning and I, I still have a ton to go and, and all that. But um, one thing I think that's really helped me with is, you know, from the financial side, when I'm underwriting a deal or when I'm looking at a deal, having a better understanding of, you know, the practical limitations. It's, uh, I think, pretty easy for us finance guys to get get our heads stuck in a spreadsheet and say, oh, well, if I just, you know, raise rents 25 bucks a month per year and I, you know, fill in these five lots, well, then, you know, it's going to be like I just said, it's gonna, we're going to make all that money. But um, it's not the case. And, and I think when you understand the way things work from an operational basis, um, it helps you when you're working through different scenarios in your underwriting to say, you know, what if we can only fill six lots instead of, you know, 12 a year? Or what if those electric pedestal upgrades cost us, you know, twice as much as we expect? So I think it helps in that. I think one of the biggest advantages um, that I've brought from my, my past experience to this job is just the variety of projects I looked at, um, you know, as we talked about, anywhere from two to 10 different uh, PPMs that I was looking at on a weekly basis. Um, and every project was different, right? And, and that's the way the mobile home park space is. Every, every project's a little bit different. So, um, you know, the ability to think through the implications of uh, certain aspects of a project versus another, I, I think was very helpful. I think, um, you know, just, the, I think what I bring to the table um, is that in-depth analysis that um, being able to understand the complexities of a PPM, being able to understand the complexities of a capital stack or different um, you know, cash flows or waterfalls or different return metrics, right? I, th I think there's a lot of um, things going on in this industry and which we'll talk about, but there's, there's just a, a misunderstanding, I think, of um, what kind of returns investors are expecting so i think having that you know that background adds value you know to our team especially um and that we we understand and, and can you know underwrite things properly and we can deliver the best returns and the most accurate returns for our investors no that all that all makes sense i want to touch on you mentioned some of the operational items and how that, that helps you. I mean, that's one thing, as you know, I'm counting on everybody on the team to get out of the field, even to our, just our regular lawyers, right? Like, get out there, look at setbacks, look at the zoning code, um, understand the HUD code, look at the fire code for spacing to help us just be more well-rounded from your standpoint from a budget. Yeah, you mentioned, okay, we, we budgeted 12 infill versus six. Okay, part of that's just, you know, market analysis is, are you gonna be able to infill 12, 12 homes in one year? But another part is, is going to be just um, practical or geographical. I mean, you, when you get out of the field, you can say, oh, yeah, there's 12 vacant lots, but six of them are 38 feet long. Oh, I didn't think about that. That's too short. Oh, this one's on a hill. This one's got tumble. This one's in a floodplain. This one has a gas line running down the middle. I'm at the move. Or, and so a combination of those things is what I think makes us valuable, makes makes us dangerous for our investors. It's like we're, we're looking at all these different different angles, but um, and that's why I'm glad you're able to learn that. And then you know, understanding the underlying accounting is obviously important for all the capital transactions from all the <coughs> homes brought in and sold and keeping track of cost basis and efficient tax prep and cost segregation, all those things. I know you've been able to dive right in all that. Uh, one thing I'd really like to, to talk about, and you and I have talked about it offline, and you can share your, share your screen here as well, is, you know, I think there's a most MHP owner operators have a rudimentary understanding of financial analysis. There, you know, there's some good operators that are, that are good at bringing in homes, good at selling homes, good at construction management, good at submetering, a lot of the CapEx projects, um, and, and generally good at back and after valuation. But um, as we've done here, gone through considerably more 
uh, financial analysis from it. You're going to pull up on your screen here, you know, day one budget, CapEx budget, sources and uses, uh, a general profit and loss, inclusive of infill and absorption. Um, and then and then a discounted cash flow analysis that shows us a bunch of rates of return from a cash on cash or equity multiple, uh, internal internal rate of return. And what part of the impetus for this call, uh, this this topic for us is I feel like there's a, a public disservice going on that uh, there are some syndicators out there that either are deceptive, I mean dishonest, or or more likely just uh, not financially astute to the level they need to be to be uh, providing accurate financial metrics for their investors and for the marketplace. So um, you're one of the sharpest financial minds I know. So I thought, why don't you lead us through and kind of how we underwrite a deal and then and then and kind of teach us the fish a little bit so our audience can, if they're syndicators, they can learn from it and um, do a better job. And then for their investors, do a better, better, more accurate job of risk analysis. And for the limited partners, frankly, it just gives them a chance to kick the tires. And I'm going to be interested in your opinion in general. As, as many PPMs and LMs have looked at, what should the LPs be asking? What kind of questions? You know, for example, like, have you ever been arrested for embezzlement? Have you ever gone bankrupt? You know, those kind of obvious ones. But uh, there's a lot more under the hood you need to look at. So um, that's a, a, a number of questions in a long preamble there as I as I really know, as I always do, as you know. But uh, anyway, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, teach us the fish. All right. Can you uh, can you see my screen here? Can you see our portfolio? I can. Okay. So this here is, is our pro forma spreadsheet. Um, several people on this call have probably seen this. I know Ferd has gone through in the past just the basic overview of our underwriting. Um, we've also made some modifications and some changes and some upgrades, if you will, to this spreadsheet. Uh, but I think the biggest thing to point out to syndicators and investors and everybody listening is, you know, we get pretty granular on uh, the way we underwrite. And we really try and dig in and understand what the actual costs are going to be, right? We go out and we get bids for line items and we um, you know, know what it actually is going to be through the due diligence process. You know, like most people, we do our back of the envelope calculation. We're going to you know, bid on a deal, but really in our, in our underwriting, try and get real deep into the, the weeds and understand everything. Make sure we didn't miss a cost or you know, underestimate something that's going to really cost us later on the deal. So this first tab here, this is our budget and our sources and uses tab. This is really just an overview of what the quote unquote day one capital expenditure is going to need to be. So. I won't go through every line item here, uh, but you can see on here, we've got you know dumpsters. How many are we going to need to clean up the park on you know right away? Road repaving, driveways, trimming trees, all our loan costs, uh, legal costs, et cetera, right? So that kind of drives how much money we're going to need to raise up front, whether it's from investors for ourselves, um, so on and so forth. And over here, we've got our, our sources of funds, right? Are we getting a loan on the deal? How much are we getting from investors? Um, and then this template is set up. You know, if we had a subordinate loan, we've got a deal we looked at recently where we got our you know our main term loan from the from the bank, and then we uh, were able to convince the seller to carry back a portion of it as well. So we got you know, very little in that deal, and it's going to be a great deal for us, um, not for our investors because we're not syndicating, but. Uh, <laughs> Um, maybe you don't really need to syndicate when you get 98% <laughs> leverage um, at acquisitions on a deal right. appraising at uh, 30, 30% over the purchase price. Yeah, yeah. So that, that deal is going to turn out well. But uh, nevertheless, right, there could be a scenario. So this, again, this is kind of our, our template, but um, that's here's your sources and then here's your uses, right? Um, we, we go over here to our profit and loss tab. You know, probably like a lot of syndicators, we project out. You know, many years we do ten years standard. Um, some syndicators don't. Uh, I've seen spreadsheets that don't. We'll look at one later. But we try and go through every year and say, okay, what's our true operating cost? And we, like I said earlier, we get bids for everything uh, that we need a bid on. Some things we just know, right? Accounting, we know it's going to cost us about twenty five hundred. 
you know, every year we get to have our CPA do the books for us. Um, but we go through and we, and we project out all the revenues, all the expenses. Um, so again, lot rent, home rent, spreadsheet scroll, set up. Scroll down, Logan, and show how that, like those rent numbers are, are tied to lease up and infill and absorption. Yes. Yeah, so, um, so our, our spreadsheet is set up so that we've got lot rent, number of lots, home rent, number of homes, these would be park owned homes, and then RV rent. Um, we don't typically buy parks with RVs, but we were looking at one recently that did. So I, this is a recent addition um, to take into account any RV rent we would have, but this is set up and it links to, show you up here, it links to our revenue line items. So we can change this on the fly and you can look at different scenarios very quickly to understand what is the deal gonna look like if we raise rents 25 bucks a year, what if, or 25 bucks a month every year, what if we do it 30 bucks, what if we do it 20, right? What if we can only fill 12 lot, or six lots versus 12 lots, right? So ours is set up um, this way so that we can do that very quickly. Um, we've also got different cap rate scenarios down here, right? So we can see in year one what the park would be worth uh, on its own. We can see what it would be worth, you know, if we had homes that were being rented and we, we cap the homes. You know, we can change our variables here as well. This drive through the, the year one formulas. Let, let me let me jump in there for a second, Logan, because they want to talk about that where you say cap the homes. I mean, in general, as, as I've mentioned before, we're not going to cap the homes, but just as a second look, say what's the what's the cap? What's the value of the non lot income? And a, a lot of times we zero it out in the P and L, and we'll sell them. We'll show the existing park and home inventory as additional uh, net sales proceeds on the discounted cash flow analysis tab to show if we sell those homes, um, and then the timing of those sales and how many, how many we sell in year one, year two, year three. But in general, you know, there's more expenses. If you do cap the homes, we increase the expense ratio on those to 50 to 60%. And if you scroll up, show the expense ratio on, I don't know which part this was, but the NOI or the expense ratio in year one is 34.352, which is pretty, pretty good, pretty standard. You know, we'd like to see 30 to 40, closer to 30 if the tenant pays in water. So in the early years, we probably have more gas reimbursement for site visits during stabilization, more management in the early years. And then over time, as the top line goes up and, and expenses don't go up, you know, to, you know, the same, you know, to, to both revenue and expenses go up five percent. There's gonna be a bigger spread, right? Because there's a bigger top top number than expense number. So over time, in this example, the expense ratio gets down below thirty percent, um, which obviously is good. The key items in here that I'm looking at um, that I think you want to make sure you do a good job on is property tax projections. And I've got a whole podcast on that topic. Because um, people mess that up a lot. And then I think people, the, the key here, when I was doing retail development, a couple of contractors were bidding this job. And, he, and I liked this quote. The guy said, the, key, the thing that will ruin your budget is not a missed price, it's a missed price, meaning the thing you forgot to include. So that's why we've got, you know, 20 rows here of, diff, of regular expenses, as opposed to you sometimes see in an OM like, you know, general and administrative, or you just see like miscellaneous or like four categories. This like insurance, taxes, miscellaneous. It's like, what? You know, you need more more detail in order to look at it in a, with a better set of eyes, frankly. Yeah, absolutely. And I think to your point, right, like that's these lines here, 34 through 36, right, where we're breaking out things specifically for this part, the well test, this, this part happened to have treatment plant and had wells. So we took that into account, right? We had RV pad sites. Um, so, you know, we were figuring out what the electric cost was on that because we were paying that versus, the park was paying that versus uh, the tenants paying it uh, for the mobile homes. So, yeah, I think that's a great point that, you know, we really dig down into it and, and try and go line by line and, and figure out, you know, what is relevant to this park and what is, is not as opposed to, you know, back in the napkin. 30 to 40 percent, which yeah, I, I think generally holds true that 30, 30 to 40 percent, but we've also looked at parks that 
um, you know, park in Iowa recently that the, the real budget came out to, you know, probably 50, 60 percent expense right. ratio. So you're, you're back in the envelope calculation when it worked in that scenario. Or you would have bought a, a bad deal and it would have cost you later. Yeah, I mean, on that point, I mean, I remember that Iowa park, you know, it's, it's important that we have the breakout. Like we weren't going to be we weren't going to be local. So I wasn't going to be out there testing the water. Um, but some the seller was. We had to get bids, and it was a combination of septic and treatment plant. It was like a unique system that the state that they didn't the DNR had never seen before. But there was an expense to that. To hire a professional here to do it, there was an expense to that that we needed to put in the budget, right? And it was well, same sort of thing. Um, so that's important. Another thing, I, I I've had parks get over forty percent, but for, for for early years during infill, you know, if you got a if you need a good full time man, if you're gonna bring fifty houses. I think you probably need a you know a manager that's going to be making thirty to fifty thousand, not a part breeder that's making three hundred dollars a month free lot rent. You're going to expect that kind of work and have that kind of success. And you can have commission structures and stuff too. And we've done that on some of our deals where we we won't see it in the PL PL on top line expense. It'll be it'll be kind of a contingent expense based on contingent occupancy. Um, and you know, just kind of built it into the basis of the home. So lots of ways to slice and dice here. Show me your your discounted cash flow analysis. This is this is important. This is the, probably the most important tab for syndicators to really for excuse me for limited partners to understand what am I going to get? You know, if I if I put a hundred thousand dollars in this deal, what's my return look like? What kinds of return? And then I'd like you to show us the, those metrics that you talked about previously and and how people are messing them up all the time. Right, right, yeah. So this is our cash flow analysis tab. So this is all fed based on the profit loss budget that we put together, the, the day one CapEx budget, the amount of equity we raise. But if you see here, we'll just walk through this one a little more closely. Um, in the first year, we've got the amount of equity that we raised, right? 450,000 on this deal. Here we've got what I'll call a toggle. So we can toggle on and off if we're gonna return uh, preferred equity to investors at, at refi or the initial equity investment and refinance right we've looked at different deals where we've said at refi we'll probably pay it back so let's see what that looks like but then we've also said well, what does it look like if we don't pay it back and we hold it and you know until year 10 and we continue to pay the prep um, how does that impact returns so that's what this does here scroll down we've got uh, net operating income asset management fees which we don't take on this deal debt service Debt service coverage, the bank really likes to see this line um, so that they know you're going to pay them first and they're going to get paid in full. Uh, subordinate loan debt service. If we wanted to see what our DSCR was with that uh, subordinate loan on here, we can see that. And then once you pay all those, what's your cash flow from operations? And then one of the first metrics we look at, what's your cash on cash ROI on a purely operational basis, right? So this doesn't take into account that we may sell homes, which will generate extra cash. We may do you know, a number of other things, which will generate extra cash, we'll refinance, you know, whatever. Um, sometimes if this is below, generally what, what we look at with this too is to say, how does this compare to our PREF, right? If we're, in this case, we've got 9% cash on cash from operations. So if the park just operates well, uh, we can pay our PREF and we're fine. Um, Sometimes this may not be above eight, right? It may be a heavy infill project, um, which we're going to need a lot of capex from the start. We don't have as much profit, so um, then we've got to, you know, figure out another way to to get that pet prep paid. Either you know, talk to our investors about accruing, uh, accruing it, but not paying it in year one, or you know, maybe we come up with source funds somewhere else. But um, that's the that's one of the first metrics we look at. Um, scroll down here, we've got, as I mentioned, home sales, additional cash that we would get from selling any park owned homes. And generally, we're going to sell them on contract for deed, four year contract for deed. So we've got it broken out here um, over five years, really, but assuming half in year one, three, four years in the last half in, in year five. Then we've got here um, the refinance. So you know, when we get the parts of stabilized value, refinance it, pay off the old debt. Here's where we can determine, do we give the investors back their equity investment and stop paying the PREF or do we you know, keep them in 
uh, just keep all their equity in and, and just keep paying the price and pay the splits a little differently. Uh, keep scrolling down here, pay off all those things. Uh, how much do you have left for distribution after you, um, after you pay the press? Just, I've had other episodes on syndication, but just to clarify for people, the PREF is the preferred return that the limited partner investors get before the syndicator gets a piece. If and when the PREF is met, meaning there's enough cash flow that's actually paid, not accrued, then there's a split. That's the first hurdle, then there's a split. And this one looks like hurdle one to 7% PREF. And then after that, the split is I believe 50-50. The GP gets 50%, the LP gets 50 we later get into if there's a, if another hurdle set, if and when we get the investors a 15% return, the split may move. And that's the, obviously negotiable once we set out in the offering memorandum or private place memorandum for each, for each deal in particular. Um, but just wanted to clarify a few definitions there for those um, who are unaware of them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, and actually, I should also clarify this. This is. Um, this cash flow is after the prep paid. I mean, the return of the initial equity. Um, this section here is where you get into the actual prep pay down um, based on one the information for just provided. Um, so you pay the prep off. Here's how much cash you have left. That's when we start getting into our hurdles. So in this deal, uh, as Bert mentioned, uh, we're going to take a split 50 50. So the investors get 7%. Um, and they get 100% of cash flow is paid until they get their 7%. And then the excess cash flow above and beyond that in this scenario uh, pays out 50 50 between you know, us as general partner and the investors as limited partners. Um, up, in, up until they, uh, the investors get a 15% return. Um, if there were additional cash flows after the investors got their 15%, uh, then it would split based on this. Now, we don't typically take 100% right off the bat uh, or right off the top after the 15%, but I showed it here because I want to uh, show you something in the, in the return metrics later. So it made more sense to put in 100 here, but you could toggle that to be you know, whatever you want. Why don't, why don't you change that to say, for a second, change the 100 to like 60. So the, the hurdle was 50, 60, and you'll see that the, addition, the numbers have changed and the investor will get additional funds. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll also point out, this is one of the things that I think makes looking at our deals probably uh, better for an investor than some others is ours is a very dynamic spreadsheet. So I've set this up so that investors can play with different scenarios and we can play with different scenarios um, to see what returns look like, whereas some investors have hard key everything. And so you, you can't tell, you know, what if the deal doesn't perform the way you say it's going to, what, what's that going to look like? But um, to your point, for if we change the 15 to a 16, all no, your you change the change the 100 to a 60. Zero. You're gonna change the outcome. Six zero. Yeah. There you go. So you can see it up in year four and five. There's a bunch more cash to the investors because your the investors are going are still getting 40 percent versus the first example of zero percent. So. But this right. spreadsheet is that easy to use at this point. It's one of those, it's easy to use, hard to build, easy to use, and very, very transparent. You can, you can, I, mean, I know you got the other boxes down there, investor returns and fees and all that you're going you're gonna to talk about as well. Right, yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and I think something else to point out here, right, on that, that hurdle you see here, here's all the excess cash flows that start going, you know, a more favorable split to the GP based on you know, what we've negotiated and agreed to. Um, but I think that's worth pointing out too is in a lot of these deals, that hurdle won't kick in until later in the project when you've really got it running and stabilized and generating excess cash and then you know you refinance it later. Um, you can see here there's not really <coughs> excess funds, if you will, for for anybody in the first three years, above and beyond that 16% you know, return in this case. Um, then you get down here to this yellow section. I think this is probably what most investors care about, if not you know, all investors, it's, it's their top concern, right? We project out here, uh, what's the internal rate of return every single year based on this cash flow analysis? 
what's the equity multiple? Um, and then what's a what's your cash flow going to look like on a sample hundred thousand dollar investment? So the internal rate of return, and this is where I think um, you get into a lot of confusion with uh, different syndicators or people who maybe don't have as as firm of a grasp on um, investing terminology and, and true returns. Internal rate of return takes into account the time value of money. So it's the uh, portion of money that you get and what year you receive it in, right? So for example, if I have a $100,000 investment and over five years, it makes 100,000. And so in year five, I get $200,000 back, right? But I get no cash flow in years one through four. Well, I've got 100% return if I average that over five years, that's 20% a year, right? But that's obviously very different if I get that full money in year five, as opposed to if I got 20,000 every single year, you know, year one, year two, year three, year four. Um, so internal rate of return um, takes into account not just the amount of money that you make, but also when you get that money. Um, I think it's probably the best, I think it is the best, uh, return metric to look at um, when looking at a real estate deal, but a lot of syndicators, I don't think understand this and they just say, well, you made a hundred percent over five years. It's 20% a year. That's your IRR. That's not, well, that's not true. I want to jump in more to, yeah. You'll, I mean, I've seen some that it's even worse than that. They'll call the IRR, the cash on cash IRR, or they'll call it the cash on cash term. It's not, it's an interim rate return. And interim rate return, in addition to time value money, which, as we know, it also takes into consideration principal pay down, so equity. It takes in cash flows and the timing thereof, and it takes in you know appreciation at the eventual exit of the property, and it's, it's calculated on a ten-year horizon with the year eleven NOI and a reversion value. And I mean, I think you probably have it still there. Do you, you have that one to show? I mean, the one we we looked at some recently and. This is an MHP syndicator, and it's, it's telling investors you're going to have an 18% IRR. And like, that's he said 18 percent cash on cash. But it was like the cash on cash was like six. The IRR was 18. If and when all the assumptions and all the infill happened and all this, like, and it's all at the end of the movie. Um, so it was inaccurate at best. Right. Yeah, I think this is the one you're you're talking about right here. Right. So here they've got over the, the course of the investment, right? Here's how much you're gonna make. And so this scenario assumes there's there's three years of cash flows and then you refinance at the end of the story. And here's how much the investors get, right? And so total return amount says, here's your annual cash flows, uh, plus the excess you get at, at refinance, plus the prep payments you've got, plus we're gonna return your initial investment, right? And that sums up to be your total return amount, which in this scenario is, is half a million dollars, right? Um, and then they've said, your total return on investment over the life of this investment is 247%, which is that total return amount divided by your return of your initial investment. There's a, a key error in this calculation here, which is return on investment is the amount of money you make um, on the money that you put in, right? So back to my earlier example of, if I put in 100,000, I make 100,000 at the end of the movie, I get my 100,000 profit plus my initial 100,000 back, I get $200,000 back at year five. My return on my investment in that scenario was 100 divided by 100 for 100%. The way it's calculated in this scenario is, using my numbers, 200,000 divided by 100,000. So it looks like to an investor, you're getting a 200% return on your investment for being in that deal, which as I just stated is not true. It's actually only 100%, all right? So it's very misleading. What this is, if you compared it to our spreadsheet, this is your equi equity multiple, or if you took your initial $100,000 investment uh, multiplied it times your equity multiple, that's uh, the total amount of money you would get back at the end of the movie. So that's the first key er error here. But then what they've done is they've compounded that error and said, let's just annualize that over this three years, right? So take the total amount 
and divide it by three, and holy cow, you're getting 82.38% annualized investor return. Well, that's not true, right? Let's fix this real quick and let's take, let's back out our initial equity investment. We'll do that also with your with your 100,000, 100,000 example. What that would do, right, is it would, it would act like there's 200,000 in profit. Really, it's only 100,000 in profit. But then the, the further exacerbated, it's 200,000 divided by five. And then right. they say, oh, cool, your cash on cash is 40%. When it really, as we know, you only had a total of 100,000, your, your, your IRR is going to be in the teens. So you're, you think you're getting a 40% yield and you because you're not looking hard or you're not financially astute and the, and the, and the syndicator is either dishonest or not financially astute and, and people are literally writing this guy checks it, because they think they're chasing the 40 percent rainbow and it's really more like 16.25. Correct. And, and that's what I was going to get to here real quickly, right? So keep people, well, let's punch these numbers in 247.15, 82.38 and 28.26, right? If we set this up the way it's presented to be, and we back out our initial equity investment, and we did something really wrong here. I can't see your screen. Am I supposed to see your screen? You can, or you should, can you not? I see my template spreadsheet, not this junior varsity one you're playing with. Okay. Let's try. about now? There you go. Now do you see the old spreadsheet? I see the... Our, our spreadsheet, and then now you see the other yeah. spreadsheet. Yeah, now I see the other one. Okay. Forgive me, I've spent a year on Zoom and I'm still trying to figure out how to use it. Um, Your skills are better used elsewhere <laughs> than Zoom proficiency. I, I'm not an IT guy. Um, anyway, so this is what I was showing, which I didn't realize people weren't seeing, but um, previously, this spreadsheet had these numbers in here. What I previously, it's a 247% total ROI. Total ROI over a three-year period. Then, annual, annualize that, right? So divide by three, right. and you've got 82.38% annualized. Right. What this should say if that were to be accurate, um, and, I, and then so I hard keyed them here so we can remember those, right? Okay. So what it should say then is don't include the return of our initial capital in our you know, return metrics. Sure. 147.15 over three years or 49.05% annualized now now this is is technically accurate i'd also point out these are not the actual returns that were projected um i've changed them to protect the innocent if you will but we're not that we're not, we're not that we're not that cruel you're, you're, you're <laughs> exposing someone but no one will know who it be exactly exactly but <laughs> i think if you now compare it here right holy cow look what a difference that makes uh, in in your annualized returns because they were being presented improperly, right? The other thing I want to point out here is they presented, it's your cash on cash return, which is your investor share of the annual cash flows, plus the amount you get at refi, plus your PREF payments divided by your initial investment, and then divide by three to annualize it. I would say mathematically, that is technically correct. However, it is, misleading, if you will, because it suggests that you're going to get 28% cash on cash every single year. What I've done here is I've said, what is the actual cash on cash in each of those years? And this is at purchase, but year one, year two, year three. Your actual cash on cash returns in those years are low, you know, high single digits, low double digits, nowhere near 28%. That 28% is as high as it is only because you get so much money back at refinance. If we use the preferred calculation, in my opinion, and the best, best calculation, the IRR, here's our initial equity outlay. Here's our annual cash flows, including the PREF payments. 
here's the return of our capital in the um, money we get at refinance. Calculate an IRR to take into account time value of money and all the other factors. And you're looking at 18.8%, which is how we do it on our deals and how is you know, the, the most accurate way, the best way versus this 28.3%. You know, I mean, of course, if I was an investor, I'd invest in this deal all day, but it, it's, you know. It's if it's wrong, real. Wrong. So you're, yeah, right. so you're basically exposing that, because for those that aren't looking at the screen, it, the real internal return, the average yield is 18.83%. And there's the spreadsheet that was put out by the syndicator. So, no, no, it's, it's total ROI of 247%. Oh, but annualized is 82%. Oh, cash on cash alone is 28.26%. Where, so you're basically saying no, cash on cash is seven to seven to fifteen, not twenty-eight. Interest return is eighteen, not eighty-two or two hundred forty-seven. So it's it's exponentially misleading, uh, right. and, and and just and just plain wrong. Um, right. So that it's amazing. Um, well, I don't want to get drill down the spreadsheets all day, but uh, this is a, this is enlightening. I know you will geek out on this if I let you for another half hour. Um, and despite being a recovering lawyer, I happen to also like to geek out and be a recovering financial analyst. So I'm, I'm with you, I'm playing with these things, but um, good stuff, Logan. What else do you wanna cover on this or are we uh, done with the spreadsheet and can wrap up on high level tips and tricks? I know you also wanna give us your insights on um, what to ask a syndicator, what to, what, to, what to look at under the hood of each prospective deal or deal team. Yeah, I, I think uh, that covers it as far as the spreadsheet. Obviously, if we were raising money on a deal and investors had questions, I'd be happy to walk through it in detail with them. Um, but things to look for um, when looking at a deal, most of them probably you know, investors know if they don't. Um, what's the experience of um, the syndicator? Some people will look at just what's the absolute number of deals. I can tell you from my experience looking at you know, hundreds, if not thousands of deals in a, in a former career that uh, in my opinion, it's not just the number of deals, but how many full cycle deals have they done and how long have they been doing it, right? I used to look at deals where one operator had done 10 senior living facilities, for example. But then you, when you looked at it, it was, well, they've really only done that for two years. Whereas another operator maybe only had, maybe had three or four that they'd done, but they'd done it for five plus years and they'd taken a couple of deals full cycle and they'd made a profit on it, right? So I think looking at the absolute number of deals um, can be good, uh, but I think it's as important to understand not just the number of deals they have, but how long they've been doing it and how well they've done those deals in the past. Um, I think stress testing, any uh, spreadsheet you look at or any scenario you look at is important, right? Understand uh, what what happens if a, if a deal doesn't work the way you expect it to. I used to work with a guy who would say, you know, when we were talking about looking at deals, you have a third party consultant put together you know, what they call the feasibility study, right? And that basically said, this project is viable because the pro forma numbers are gonna do X, Y, and Z. But the joke was always, I've never seen an infeasibility study, right? Meaning nobody shows you that study they got that said, actually, this deal is going to work, not going to work. They go back and find three other consultants to give them the answer they want, right? So stress test your deal and see what it looks like. Um, I, I got a similar story on that I heard recently. It's, nobody ever showed a bankruptcy in a Microsoft Excel spreadsheet. Exactly. No one's ever, no one ever performs that their business is going to go under, that their property is going to tank. It right. reminds me of that, you know, quasi joke of there's been more fiction written in Excel than in Word. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So, you know, we sit here and tout our spreadsheet, which I think is superior, but, but, you know, you can also test it and see what happens if things don't work the way they, they want it to. Um, Something that's probably talked about on here a lot, find out, does your operator, or your syndicator have all their permits in place and do they have all their necessary approvals, contracts in place, whatever it may be. Um, I used to look at deals where 
you know, everything appeared to be good to go. And then you found out, well, they don't actually have a real construction contract. They got an estimate, right? They haven't signed on the dotted line. And so you fund the deal and then it, you know, you find out three months later, oh, we've never broke ground because we didn't actually have a real, you know, construction contract in place, right? So make sure your permits and contracts are actually in place um, or at least understand where they are in the process. Um, or in our business, that the, the, the common, I guess the, the more accurate version or in mobile home parks would be, you know, does, you, do you have, does, does a seller have an operating permit? Do you have a zoning letter? Do you have right. a clean phase one? Do you have clean title? Do you have clean survey? So it's not as much construction permits in most cases as much as, you, you know, you don't want to, oops, the day after you buy it, they tell you that, you know, the city taking the property to put in a park or something. Right. Yeah. And no, all, all the things that I know you talk about um, regularly to your, your listeners. Um, I, and, and the other thing, the last thing I'll say, I could go on for a while probably, but I, I think transparency, um, especially when the syndicator is raising money, um, are they willing to answer any questions you have? Are they willing to, you know, like we would do, walk you through our spreadsheet, help you understand what's going on? Because if they're not transparent with you when they're trying to get your money, imagine how much they're not going to tell you when they've got your money and that deal's not working the way it's supposed to, right? Um, you're not going to get a, a word out of them. So it's one of those intangible things, I think. But um, I think you really need to make sure your, your syndicator is willing to be open and honest about any questions or concerns you, you would have up front. No, I, you know that one's a sore spot for me because I, I sold that one park a few years ago and I had to keep some money in the deal for this fund, this private equity fund, as a condition of the sale because they supposedly their CMBS lender required it. And that group, I've been in that deal for, I don't know, four years and we, got, we own five parks in there. They have produced zero financial reports they file tax returns late. They violate the loan covenants of the bank. They violate SEC covenants as it pertains to syndication. Um, they mismanage the properties. Everything's wrong. It's like transparency. They don't. They can't even spell MHP, and they're out there raising money. Uh, they were raised fifty million in the first month. He left Wall Street. Raised fifty million in his first month, and he's good at that. Clearly. Um, but not very good at operations. And I'm watching my, it's a mod, relatively modest investment I had to keep in the deal. I'm watching it just flounder because these guys don't know what they're doing. But then also I give zero transparency, zero access information. Um, so very frustrating um, on my end. So yeah, definitely a source spot. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think like I said, I'd probably give you a lot more, but I think that's probably the top ones I got. Yeah, I mean, well, I appreciate the tips and tricks. Appreciate you walking through uh, the spreadsheet. Uh, I know where to find you. I can see you at the side of my office here, but uh, where can people find you if they want to reach out to you? Uh, so I'm on LinkedIn, just look for Logan Moore. I don't think there's too many of us, but um, it's the one that it's at third floor properties. Also search for mobile home park operator, owner, investor, et cetera. Um, or my email is logan at thirdfloorproperties.com. Third floor properties is T H I R D I B is in the Roman numeral four properties.com. So logan at thirdivproperties.com. All right. Thanks, Logan. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks, Logan.